Now we have connected the reading from Daniel 7 regarding beasts, uh, the four beasts of Daniel 7. We very directly connected it to the prophetic vision of John in Revelation 13, which sees the same four beasts rolled into one beast. So the beast of, uh, of the book of Daniel are presented separately. The beast, the singular beast of the Revelation 13 is presented as <clears throat> the incorporation of the characteristics of all of the prior beast, of all the prior three beasts. So it's essentially an indication of three predecessors in history who now have been amalgamated into a singular expression. Now, another, let's go back and, and establish with great care the reading, uh, the description of the four beasts from Daniel 7 and then I'll come back and continue the commentary on uh, the, the reason why um, John sees them in the reverse order in which they appear in the book of Daniel. I saw in my vision by night and behold the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, Daniel says in verse 2, of Daniel 7. Continuing, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each one different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. I'll, I'll read through and then I'll come back. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked and there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, it was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man and a, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I want to pause there. He will, uh, in, in Daniel uh, verse 15, Daniel 7 verse 15, he continues to say, I was grieved in my spirit within my body and the vision and the visions of my head troubled me. So I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me 
and made known to me the interpretation, and this was the interpretation. Those four great beasts, which are, or those great beasts which are four, are four kings which will arise on the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. But that wasn't quite satisfying to him. He was very troubled by the fourth beast. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails uh, of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with his feet, and the ten horns that were on his head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely, that horn at which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and this horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until until the Ancient of Days, until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was given in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Then he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms which shall devour the whole earth, trampling it and breaking it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints. Now the previous reading said he will wage war against the saints and overcome them, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hands for a time and times and half a time, but the court will be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart." So it would appear that there was no immediacy in understanding uh, from Daniel's viewpoint what these things meant in as much as they were not going to affect him. These were things for the future. Now I want to focus just briefly here on a singular aspect of what we've read and then I want to, I'll move on but I'll come back and unpack it in much greater detail. Because many think that, many infer that this this horn I saw the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now he seems to choose to distinguish between the fourth beast which was crushing, trampling down, devouring with his, uh, the, the humanity in general, and crushing and trampling 
down the residue that he did not devour. Um, he was he was crashing and crushing and trampling them down with his feet. But then the the little horn was the means by which it waged war against the saints and the means by which he prevailed against them. Very important distinction because we typically conflate the two and we say that the beast will trample down the saints and the beast will crush the saints and the beast will devour the saints. It's the horn, this little horn, whatever it is, meaning I haven't unpacked it yet, Uh, whatever it is, it is the thing of the beast, it's the instrument of the beast that wages war against the saints. Why is this significant? Because the manner in which he wages war is described in the very nature of the horn, the horn. For the the, the term for horn here may indicate a horn on the head of an animal which projects the power of that animal like the horns of a Cape buffalo. Even the lions are afraid of the horns of the Cape buffalo, one of what they call in South Africa the big four. Uh, A lion is no match. Even a pride of lions can be in serious trouble attacking uh, a Cape buffalo, what they call in uh, in, uh, up in, in the Chobe Reserve, they call them the Dugger boys because they dig with the horns and flip mud on, the back of the, on their backs because these are black animals in searing tropical heat. Uh, in uh, the Chobe in the country of Botswana, they call them the Dugger boys. So in the picture of this beast, the horn is a projection of its power. But in this little horn, the word keren, Q-E-R-E-N, keren in the Hebrew, it is literally a horn or figuratively a cornet, a trumpet. It's clearly true that the secondary reading is the more accurate one. Why? Because textually, we just read where Daniel was told that this fourth beast is a fourth kingdom. So though it's presented as this massively powerful, global dominating beast, it's not a horn in the domestic reference to a horn, like I said with with the Dugger boys, the Cape Buffalo. It is a sound, it is a trumpet sound, a a cornet. It's something that announces a particular sound. So the war with the saints, and this accounts for why he can defeat the saints. It's a clash of cultures. It's a sound that is blasphemous. It is undercutting divine culture, supplanting divine culture with a lie. And it's a lie that plays to the fears of mankind so thoroughly 
that he's able to devour them with this consuming fear. And whoever opposes him, whoever opposes this beast, will encounter the formulated power of the lie. What do I mean by the formulated power of the lie? He will build entire systems to control mankind based upon their fear of being without provision and without protection. And whoever does not subscribe to his systemic kingdom will be crushed and devoured by the power of exclusion, where you will be excluded. So it means that the saints are going to have their own kingdom. And indeed, these two kingdoms are presented in juxtaposition. That in the destruction of this kingdom, typified by this great beast, iron, teeth and uh, and bronze claws and uh, dreadful and terrible and all the rest. On the one hand, that has ten horns, a little one that overthrows three other, which to me is the indication that this is a religious horn because it has to speak the philosophy of the kingdom of this kingdom. And every philosophical view of any kingdom puts any kingdom, by the way, first and foremost, any kingdom exists to put on display the nature and the character of its king. We will see, going forward in the reading from then from Revelation 13, we will see a reference to how Satan, that ancient serpent, gave his power, his throne, and great authority to this beast. So in as much as it is a metaphorical reference to a beast, Practically, it's an arrangement designed to put on display the one whose power it projects, and that's none other than Satan. We know what Satan's kingdom looks like, and we'll go back to that shortly. But I want to to speak a little bit more on the matter of this horn waging war against the saints and prevailing against them. Listen, in this war for the culture, for the hearts and minds of mankind, this cultural war, the more popular view will not be the kingdom's view. Why? Because the beast, the the philosophy of the beast was designed to capture the souls of men in regards to the things they most commonly fear. Let me explain. This is how Satan captures human beings. God made the human being to have three components of being, a spirit, which is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma, a soul, which is suke, and a body, which is sar, S-A-R-X. All three all three of these aspects of being, referred to as once in 1 Thessalonians where Paul said, I think in chapter 5, I pray that you may be uh, 
presented at the coming of our Lord blameless. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be presented blameless at the coming of the Lord. So these three components of being, each one has a life in it that is capable of sustaining that aspect of being. The highest order of being is the spirit and the life within the spirit is called Zoe, Z-O-E with the two dots over the E. Now, that life is not derived from or sustained by anything in creation. That is the life of God that is available to sustain the human spirit. The life within the soul is called suke, P-S-E-U-C-H-E. The soul is also called suke. We get the term psychology from it. The life within the suke is derived from observation, analysis, synthesis, and theory, the scientific method. God gave humankind, the ability to function in the earth, to translate the wisdom of the heavens that comes into the being through the Zoe life of God, comes into the spirit, filtered through the soul, projected through the body. That's when the human being is in perfect, divinely arranged order. The body the SAR has a life in it that is called BIOS, B-I-O-S, and the study of which is biology, the logic of the BIOS. A human being takes in impulses through the five senses. Five senses are at work even at times when the person is sleeping. And impulses can come through and do come through routinely through the five senses. Now these impulses have the capability of affecting the person uniquely, depending on who the person is, what their prior experiences have been, what their family lives are, and all of, all of that. Now, the soul, the soul assigns an emotional uh, uh, quotient to these impulses taken in through the five senses. So for example, a sound, a sight, a vision, a smell, all these come within context that are unique to the being's experience. If they come in the context that threatens the life of the human being, the soul assigns an emotion, the emotion of fear, to it. Now, so when the enemy comes to attack a person, He causes the soul, he uses the the understanding of how the soul is going to respond to a particular external influence and he knows that the soul is going to respond in a certain way if the external influence is of a certain nature or kind. And he will often use other human beings as perpetrators of these things to stir up uh, the emotions of the soul which he knows predictably are going to be those emotions of the soul. So he can't read your mind, but he does know how you're going to respond and he does have some level of control over the influences he stirs up in your environment. So when this great beast wages war against the saints, it's going to be a war that draws upon all of the power 
of the enemy concerning the soul of man. And you can anticipate that in that time, and it actually says it in the scriptures, in that time, wave upon wave of things threatening the human being will cause such a quantum of fear to blanket the earth that even the Word of God is not going to have the same redemptive effect on mankind as the power of the lie is going to have. And we know that because it says that not many will actually be saved compared to the broad way that leads to destruction and many who walk on it, the way of righteousness and peace will be narrow and few there will be who find it. So in this conflict, this horn that is speaking, and he's speaking blasphemous things, lies, deceptions, falsehoods, alternative truths, alternative facts. Isn't it astonishing that we live in the time when lying is the order of the day and you cannot depend even on leaders? And I'm not talking about any particular party or I'm not even talking uniquely about politics. It's about business, it's about science, it's about political leaders. We're at a time when but for the discerning of the Spirit, you don't know what the truth is. We are already at that time. This is the manner in which the enemy will wage war against the saints and compared to the success of the saints in speaking to humankind, the message of hope and salvation, he will prevail against us. The enemy will the message of the enemy will prevail against us and the lie will appear to be the truth. Now, does that mean that he will crush and devour us? No, because his systems cannot trap, cannot contain us and we are destined to overcome him because God is even now taking us up to a level of trust in who He actually is that is the only certainty with which we'll be granted immunity from the oppression of this great beast. I'm Sam Solon, continue to study as we unpack the beast.